On today's episode, it's all about color and how to mix it. Stay tuned. Promotional consideration for Amazing Plastic the Scale Model Show is brought to you by Tenet Controls, makers of scale model lighting systems. Tenet Controls brings models to life. Visit them today at tenetcontrols.com. And by Paleo Acrylic Paints, with a wide range of highly pigmented colors specially formulated for models and miniatures. Paleo Acrylic Paints sold at hobby stores worldwide. Hey, welcome to another episode of Amazing Plastic. I'm your host, Richard Cleveland. So glad to have you with me again this week. Today, we are talking about color mixing. This is part two of our paint theory, and uh, we're going to be talking a lot about how to mix custom colors. We're going to start with the primaries, go into secondaries and complementary colors and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to show you how to mix them. We're going to be using acrylic paints for that. And uh, you can uh, pick up acrylic paints pretty much anywhere. But what I'm going to be showing you on today's show is not only for use with acrylic paints, but you can really use that with any paint that you desire, whether you're using lacquers, whether you're using enamels or acrylics, it really doesn't matter as long as you understand the basics of color. And that's what I'm going to try and demonstrate to you today. Kind of give you some theory and show you that you yourself can mix colors just as easily as I can. And uh, maybe save yourself a little bit of money by saving by, you know, making your own custom colors. I'm also going to be taking a look at the Iwata Eclipse CS airbrush today. We're going to break it down. We're going to show you all of the all of the uh, internal workings, how to take it apart to clean it, and how to put it all back together again and explain some of the uh, intricacies of that particular airbrush. I can't wait to use it. We're going to use it next week on the show. And uh, when we start painting, which is what's coming up on next Monday's show. We're going to show you how to use some of the theory that we did today, mix up some master color to paint our victim on the Creature from the Black Lagoon a model kit, which is produced by Mobius Models. And all of the products that you see that we use here on the show can be found at our newest sponsor, PM Hobbycraft. PM Hobbycraft has been around for over 50 years. They're family owned. They've always been family owned and they are one of the largest and longest running hobby shops in all of Canada. You can find them online at pmhobbycraft.ca. So check them out today. And if you're looking for models, you're looking for paints, you're looking for brushes, it doesn't matter. They've got it all and they can pretty much help you with anything hobby related that you're looking for. So check out PM Hobbycraft at pmhobbycraft.ca. Now, there's a few people I want to mention on today's show, people that I've kind of missed out a little bit on in the last little while. Uh, I want to thank Lou Del Meso from Aztec Dummy. Lou sent us over some painting masks that we're going to be using later on this season, uh, and we're going to show you the benefits of how to use the Aztec Dummy painting masks on a project coming up. So be be watching for that. If you're looking for painting masks and you're looking for the Aztec Dummy brand in particular, which I highly recommend, you can check them out on better online retailers such as Cult TV Man and Federation Models. So go and check them out and uh, get a set of painting masks for your Starship or uh, other other model that you might be looking for. He has over 30 products in his lineup, so pretty much you might have what you're looking for. Also want to thank the fine folks over at uh, the fiber optic store. They sent us over a whack of fiber optic not too long ago. And, uh, we've been giving it away to, to, uh, some of our community members so that they can experiment with it as well, because Lord knows I don't need a whole lot of, uh, 3,500 feet of fiber optic. Uh, you could light my whole house with that, but I do want to thank them over at the fiber optic store for generously upping the original order that I made and sending over 
a whole bunch of uh, extras for us to play with here on the show. And we're going to be demonstrating more about fiber optics. And if you were watching Friday's show, you saw Jack take you through the ins and outs of getting ready to use fiber optic in your model kit. So it's well worth it. Um, who else do I want to quickly acknowledge uh, for all the tireless work that they do? Christina Pritchard. Um, she is what we call the first lady of model building. She's just starting up her own YouTube channel. She is a, a lovely young lady and very talented from England. And she, uh, she's more of the queen of destruction than she is the queen of building. Uh, she will take a beautiful kit and she will bash that thing up. So it looks like it's been through hell and back. Uh, so check out Christina Pritchard's YouTube channel, or if you're interested, you can find her over at our uh, community, which is Amazing Plastic on G+. So go over and check it out. Say hi to her. And there's all kinds of great model builders over there as well. And uh, check out all the tips, tricks, hints, builds, all kinds of stuff going on. I want to quickly touch on the Jimmy build. Now, admittedly, I haven't started my Jimmy build yet. Uh, and the Jimmy build is a opportunity for you to get involved by building a model that cost you no more than $20. Um, that doesn't include your paint and, and glue and all that other stuff. Just the kit itself, you could not have paid more than $20 for. And uh, we're building these models for charity. What uh, we're going to do is auction them off at or start an auction at the end of March uh, and run the auction through the month of April and through May. And hopefully we'll get all these models uh, sold and raise, I'm hoping to raise about $3,000 for the Jimmy Fund. If you're not familiar with the Jimmy Fund, it is a cancer research um, outlet that uh, helps to uh, bring cancer awareness and help to fund cancer research uh, for children in need that are suffering from cancer. So it's a good cause. If you're looking for more details about it, you can check it out on our Google Plus page or head over to amazingplastic.com and check it out over there because all of the details are there as well. Now, let's get into the show. So the first thing that we're going to talk about today is painting. Well, every model that we want to build ends up being painted. And when we paint our models, there's a few steps that we have to go through. But the first thing we need to do is understand color. And that's what we're going to do today is look at color, how to mix it, what the benefits are to mixing it. And we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the other things that, that we do uh, when it comes to painting our models. Now that when you paint your model, it's kind of the icing on the cake, as it were. And every good paint job starts with a good foundation. You have to prep your kit, and we've talked about that on previous episodes. You also need to prime your kit, and there are several different primers available. You can get a lacquer-based primer. As you see here in this slide, we have a lacquer-based primer. We've got uh, a can of um, acrylic-based primer. We also have a can of enamel-based primer. And uh, then we have the Vallejo uh, primer, which you shoot through an airbrush. All of these different primers have their benefits and drawbacks. The benefit to the lacquer-based primers is they dry quickly. The drawback, of course, is that they uh, are very solvent-based, so they have a very strong odor. And if you're not using a respirator, then uh, you can get very sick very quickly. Um, now, you also have enamel-based. Uh, again, something you should be wearing a, a respiration mask for, something to keep uh, those fumes out of your lungs because uh, it can be harmful to you. But uh, acrylic-based primers, for the most part, are fairly safe. Um, I would still use a mask and, and spray in a well-ventilated area. Uh, so these are some of the, the differences uh, between the primers. Now let's move on to paint. There's all kinds of paint out there. Regardless of the type of paint you use, again, whether it be enamels, if you're, if you're a Model Masters fan, or you may use the Tamiya enamels and acrylic uh, paints, you also may use uh, some of the Vallejo paints. Uh, all of these paints are wonderful paints, and uh, they all work very well in our scale model building. As you can see in this slide, we have a variety of different paints here. Uh, we also have some artist acrylics, uh, which is what we're going to be using today to show you uh, the uh, the color mixing techniques uh, for mixing your own custom colors. And we're going to go through the theory of 
paint as well. So here we have uh, all the different paints uh, or some of the different paints that are available on the market. There's probably as many different paints available as there are sizes of paintbrush or model kits on the market today. Uh, they come in all different colors, shades, textures, uh, you name it, you can find it. Just go to your local hobby store and uh, go and check it out. So now let's get right down to business. Let's head over to the bench and take a look at mixing our own custom colors. Okay, we're back here at the bench and you can see that we have a variety of colors here that we are going to use to do our basic color mixing. And let me explain why I've got Artist Tube Acrylics as opposed to say the Vallejo uh, Model Air or Tamiya or Model Master paints, which uh, we use here in the studio as well. Um, these are easier to mix. Uh, they're great for demonstration, and I use these types of paints when I first got started painting miniatures, and I could pretty much make any shade of color I wanted out of these five colors, and the basics are primary red, which is right here, primary yellow, primary blue, black, and white. With those five basic colors, you can pretty much create any color you wish. So we're going to have a look at all of these and I will show you how to mix them. And then we'll go into mixing up a little bit of flesh tone as well. And I'll show you the colors I use for that. We'll be right back. Now, when painting models, you can uh, get most colors, if not all colors, pre-mixed off the shelf from your favorite manufacturer. Um, but with a little practice, you can actually make most colors you're ever going to use out of three primary colors. And those three primary colors are red, yellow, and blue, as I explained earlier. Now, from those three colors, we can make what's called secondary colors. By taking red and yellow, we make orange. Yellow and blue make green. And blue and red make purple. These are what's known as our secondary colors. Now, once we have these colors, we can change the shade of these colors just by, or we can change the shade naturally just by uh, varying the ratio of color that we mix together. Now, with our six colors here, our red, yellow, and blue, which are our primary, our secondary, orange, green, and purple, there are three complementary colors. So orange and blue are complementary. Red and green are complementary. And yellow and purple are complementary. Now, with our complementary colors, we can naturally shade or darken eat any one of our secondary colors or our primary colors. So you can see we can make that orange a little darker. The red naturally darkens the green. And the yellow naturally darkens the purple. Or the purple naturally darkens the yellow, giving it a more truer tone. It's not that you shouldn't use black to darken uh, your paints, but if we use black, let's say we use a little bit of black with this yellow here. I'll just take a little dab. When we mix black with it, especially yellow, it tends to make it almost a green color an olive drab. It's not to say that you, you shouldn't do that, but maybe by mixing with a complementary color, um, you can pretty much get a much better shade. Now, if we take these colors and we mix them equally, we can see that our yellow we get almost a burnt umber sort of color there. By mixing the yellow and the purple together.
red and green mix into a burnt sienna kind of color. And yellow and or orange and blue are a raw umber sort of color. Giving you those shades of different shades of brown. Now I haven't done that well, but you can certainly do that. Now with white, you can lighten any color. So by using a little bit of white, you can lighten colors. By using complementary colors with uh, your secondary or primary colors, you can lighten or darken them naturally or create new shades of color. So there you have it. There's our look at color mixing. Pretty simple. Get yourself a color wheel just like this one, and this will certainly help you when you're trying to, uh, let's see if we can put that, when you're trying to mix your colors, and you can mix pretty much any type of paint that you've got, whether it be acrylics, um, enamels, or what have you. You can pretty much uh, mix any color together to get you the color shades that you want. So there you have it, a look at color. And we're now going to go over, and I'm going to grab my palette here, and we're going to show you how I mix up flesh tones and what colors I use to do that. Okay, we're back. And you know, most of the questions I get are, how do I make skin tones? And I've gotten this question a lot because I've done a lot of miniatures in my time. Um, and the three basic colors that I use for any skin tone are burnt sienna, raw sienna, and white. By mixing these three colors together, you can pretty much get any shade of Caucasian flesh tone that you wish. Um, I'm going to show you how to mix those up and get a base color. And once we have our base color, we can actually vary that color. We're going to use a palette right here. Take a little bit of raw sienna. Oop, we just got a little bit off the side there. The wonders of television. Now, if that should happen to you, you see how we got that little blob there? If that should happen to you, don't fret. Don't get upset. Just take your brush. And just get it out of there and put it in your palette. There you go. So we've got quite a bit of color there. We don't need that much, but, you know, we've got it. We'll use it. So there's our raw sienna. Here's our burnt sienna. A little blob of burnt sienna in there. And we're going to add some white. Now, as I said, by using these three colors, you can pretty much get any shade of Caucasian flesh that you wish. Do we want a lot of uh, dark flesh? Well, we can do that. And we're just going to take one of the little wells here. We're going to take some paint. We'll take some of the raw sienna. Give our brush a quick little clean here. Get off the excess water. We'll grab a little bit of our raw sienna, or our burnt sienna, and we're going to mix those together. Now, this is starting to look a little bit too red. Um, and, of course, we're not going to use that as our skin tone. We're actually going to take some of that white, and we're going to add it in there to lighten it up. So we'll just take a little bit of white, and we'll put it in there, and that will lighten our skin tone naturally. And if you think it's a little too light, you want to experiment with this, and that's definitely a little too light. So maybe we want to add a little bit more color to that. We can see that that's just a little too light for what we want to start as a base coat with our flesh. We're just going to take a little bit more raw sienna and put it in there and this is now starting to get to where we want it once we've got our master color mixed up and we know how much of that color we we're going to need i could use just a touch more i'm 
There we go. Now, I like to to have my skin tones a little bit more on the red side than I do uh, on the light side because I like to start with a, a darker base skin tone. And these cream paints, I know it kind of looks a little grayish on camera, but that is a really good skin tone to start with. And then as you lighten that, Let's uh let's just kind of mix it up here. We'll get that get all three of those colors in there. There we go. So if I want that to be a little bit darker, that to me is a good skin tone. It's got just the right amount of red in it. It's got just the right amount of yellow. If I'm going to lighten that color, I'm possibly going to use a little bit more raw sienna. I'm just going to put some in my well there. I take a little bit of that raw sienna and a little bit of white, and I'm just going to lighten it naturally. And the more I lighten it, You can see now it also starts to becoming lighter and lighter, and that'll allow me to do highlights and the like. If I wanted this to be an Asian skin tone, I would certainly add um, a little bit more raw sienna to it. Uh, if I wanted it to be a African American skin tone, I would add a little bit of burnt umber to the mix. And just go from there. And usually I will mix up a master color. And uh, when I start painting figures, uh, which we're going to see next week, you'll see how all of this comes together and how we mix up a master color, how we thin it, and how we, uh, we apply it to the figure. And next week we are going to be painting the victim from the Creature from the Black Lagoon kit, which is done by Mobius. So until next week, we'll see you back here at the bench. Get your brushes ready. Well, we're over here at the bench, and we have here the Iwata Eclipse, the ultimate versatility, reliability, and performance airbrush from Iwata Medea. This airbrush uh, comes to us from the fine folks at Iwata, and uh, we're going to do a review and a breakdown and show exactly how this thing works. Uh, first, let's talk about the packaging. It's not uh, super duper packaging as you find on some of their higher end models but it is a uh, good packaging if you want to store your airbrush uh, and when you're not using it on the side you can tell that it is a genuine I iwata product because it has this wonderful little um, hologram on it that says iwata and uh, on the side of the box it tells you all of the different uh, lines of airbrushes that they have and on the back of the box, it tells you the different airbrushes that are available in the Eclipse line. We have the CS, which is the one we're reviewing today. The BS, which has a much smaller color cup on it. The side feed, which is the SBS. And then the Eclipse BCS, which is a bottom feed or siphon feed um, airbrush. All right, so let's uh, let's get into taking this thing out of the package. All right, so we're going to remove the clear plastic top we're going to get rid of that and now as we look inside we can see that it's got some pretty dense foam in it um, not quite as dense as what we saw in the neo uh, on the last airbrush we used but uh, the airbrush itself is a nice weighted airbrush it uh, it's got some heft to it and uh, we're going to take this part and show you all the different pieces uh, we also have a little wrench which comes in very handy we'll get rid of the foam which is all laser cut by the way so you know you this if you put this into a a hard little travel case if you could find one that this would fit into uh good like uh let's say one of the pelican cases small transport pelican cases this might fit very well and protect your airbrush for a long time to come all right, inside the bottom, we get uh, some of the super lube. 
Super Lube is their um, brand of lubricant for your airbrush, and we'll show you how to use that. And you've seen me use that on the Neo, and also a full set of instructions. All right, so in the instructions, tells you about the versatility, reliability, and performance of the airbrush, gives you some welcome and thank you for purchasing. Uh, it shows you all of the airbrushes in uh, their glory. It tells you a little bit about each one. As I said, the CS is the one that we're going to be talking about today. Gives you some details about compressors and fine lines and uh, what the cutaway handle is for and maintenance and all kinds of good stuff. Troubleshooting, cleaning tips. So this manual is pretty uh, in-depth, which we don't see a lot on some other airbrushes. Gives you a breakdown of the needle. Talks a little bit about the pistol grip filter, which we talked about uh, last time uh, when we did a review on the Deluxe Airbrush set from Iwata. And breaks down all the parts. Here's an exploded view. And then all of the all of the parts that you get with it. And, of course, it talks about its five-year warranty. Genuine Iwata warranties. Um, five years is, you know, probably one of the best warranties uh, out there for an airbrush uh, today. So there you go. That's a, a look at the the written material that comes in. Now let's look at the airbrush. The airbrush itself is a dual action uh, airbrush that um, has all the bells and whistles that you might need. One thing about this airbrush that it doesn't have is a replaceable color cup, much like the Neo where we were able to take the larger color cup off and put on a smaller one. This one does not have that ability. Um, so unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that, but uh, we are going to be able to uh, break the airbrush down and show you exactly uh, what uh, what this comes with. Some of the features is this is a one third of an ounce color cup, so it holds a lot of material. This is designed to spray between twenty and sixty psi. This airbrush will handle up to sixty psi, uh, depending on the material in which you are uh, spraying through it. Uh, heavier paints, you may want to use um, a much heavier. Uh, or a much higher pressure. Um, this thing will s comes with a three or 0.35 needle. It will also accept a 0.5 needle. It doesn't go any finer than that. So if you're go looking at this airbrush to do really fine hairstyle detail, unfortunately, you're not going to get it with this airbrush. Um, but it does come apart quite easily. Uh, the nozzle itself, I want to point this out, the nozzle itself is broken down into three distinct pieces. First, we have the spray cap, which or the needle cap, which comes off. And a lot of people will take that needle cap off just because they want to uh, get a much finer spray or be able to clean the tip. This will prevent you from getting at the tip when the tip uh, gets what's known as tip dry, and that's just the drying of the paint on the tip while you're spraying. Um, so some people take this off. I typically leave mine on. I just use a little bit of a cotton swab with some airbrush cleaner on it, and I'll just kind of run it in there. That way I don't bend my needle. I'm kind of going around the needle uh, as I do it. You can see here that the needle is pointing out. Let me see if I can just switch cameras here really quickly and get you a nice close-up of that you can see that the needle itself is pointed outwards all right and as we remove the next which is the crown cap this is this cap right here we simply just screw that off and we'll pop that over there. Now, when you're taking apart your airbrush, um, the airbrush itself should be, you should take very, very good care with it because your needle is sticking out here and you don't want to drop it or bend it or, or mar the end of that because that will affect the performance of your airbrush. Now, the next piece here is the um, nozzle cap. This is this piece right here. 
And the nozzle cap, uh, of course, protects everything inside. The way to get that nozzle cap off, of course, is to use the little wrench that comes with it. And you just kind of give it a twist till it loosens. And then you can take it off by hand. And we'll just get that off there. I tend to do things a little slowly. Um, just because I don't want to, you know, rush and, and get things uh, all broken up. Now, this piece here, of course, is our needle cap, or pardon me, our nozzle. This is our our three our point three five nozzle tip, and that is what the needle rides in and gives you, of course, uh, everything that you you desire for paint coming out the end. Now, we're going to take off the handle, and we'll get at the business end of the airbrush. We have the needle chuck right here. We want to loosen that when taking out the needle. You can take out the needle straight. Try not to bend that because if you bend that, you're in deep, deep trouble. Now we, we're going to take off the needle assembly here. We're going to unscrew it. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm taking this completely apart because as um, we work with our airbrush. We sometimes have to take it apart, depending on the paints that we use, and give it a really thorough cleaning. I recommend that everybody give their airbrush a really thorough cleaning, um, just because if you don't, you can uh, ruin a perfectly good airbrush. This airbrush r runs at a little over $100, if I'm not mistaken. I think you can find it on online for less, um, but uh, the airbrush itself, uh, is probably one of the better airbrushes to use um, when you are starting out uh, with airbrushing. It's If you've already been airbrushing and you're using something like a Pash H, a single action, and you want to move to a double action, uh, this is definitely one of the ways to go. So we've completely disassembled the airbrush. Now we can get inside and we can give it a good cleaning uh, through the backside barrel. We want to, when we're cleaning this, uh, we want to use pipe cleaners and, of course, our cleaning solutions uh, for the airbrush. So that's how easy it is to take this airbrush apart. Not difficult at all. So now we're going to reassemble. We've got the body. Our color cup is clean. We've done everything that we need to do uh, to get this this ready. Now, one of the nice things about this airbrush, I don't know how well this the camera is going to pick this up, but this particular plunger and all the plungers or triggers on the uh, Iwata products have a little bit of an indentation on one side of the trigger. And what that allows you to do is get full range of that trigger inside the body of the airbrush. Now, putting this back in can be a little bit tricky. You have to line up the little tab there, uh, which is at the bottom. I don't know how well you can see that. That little tab there, the little dongle that kind of, you can see it wiggling around there. You want to line that up and put the indent, which is on the trigger, to the back of the airbrush. You want to line this up with the, the air plunger hole. And sometimes it can be a little difficult. Once you get in there, you'll know it's seated. And there we go. So we oh, we thought we had it in there. This is probably the most frustrating part of using this airbrush. Okay, so we've got it set in there. We're just going to hold it in place while we put back in our uh, needle assembly. And the needle assembly is got this little rocker on it. And... There's only one real way to put this rocker in. And as you can see, the rocker itself has a small end on top and a wide end on the bottom. You want to get that small end to the top so that it comes through the hole in the body behind the trigger. So you're just going to tilt it. Let's see if I can do this. Tilt it, pop it in, and there you go. Now we will put our spring back on. And just before we go ahead and put the back assembly on, we're going to give this a little bit of lubricant. I like to put a little bit of lubricant around the threads of the of the part. I'll just take that. Just put a little drop on there. Put our super lube off to the side. Slide it on. Now, be careful when you're putting this on because the one thing you don't want to do 
is strip the threads. So you saw me, what I typically do is make sure my threads are lined up properly is I turn it backwards as if I were removing it. And then I put it, I, I start to turn it clockwise to get it in there. Now you want to seat this right down inside there, finger tight. So keep going until it stops, until it bottoms out. And when it bottoms out, you know that you're you're there. And you don't have to um, spend a lot of time uh, worrying about um, using a wrench or anything on this to get it super tight because you don't need it super tight. Now, I want to put a little bit of lube right into my trigger assembly here. I'm just going to add a little little drop there, and I'm just going to move that around just so that my needle is not sticky or doesn't get sticky. Now we want to put the needle cap or the needle tip back on. One thing you want to notice about these needle tips is that they are a conical shape. So you can see how they taper back. And they're designed that way so that when you put them back into the airbrush, they seat in and they square themselves perfectly every time. All right, so now we're going to get our needle chuck nut. We're going to screw it on. Now, if you bottom out this this needle chuck nut, before you put your needle in, you're never going to get your needle in there because this is designed as a tensioner to hold the needle. So we're just going to back it off about a turn, not so that it comes all the way off. We're going to take our needle. We're going to put a little bit of lube on our needle, just a little dot of lube on our needle. There we go. And we'll just kind of roll it around through our fingers. When you've taken apart your airbrush, this is a great time to uh, inspect the, ne the tip of the needle. Because when you in inspect the tip of the needle, you can see under a magnifier of some sort that this uh, can be bent or have a little hook on it. You can draw it across your finger and see if it's it's hooking your skin that way you kind of know if it you've got some problems with your needle it might be time to replace it now we're going to put the needle back inside the body of the airbrush i like to spin the needle it helps that lubricant uh, as it's going all the way through and always remember never force the needle you see now that that needle has gone way too far as i've started to push out the the needle caps if that happens just kind of push it back and what we don't want to do at this point um is tighten up the chuck we're going to pull back the needle a little bit we've got the needle to the end we're going to pull it back just a little bit we're going to put on our our cap here and the reason i don't tighten the needle up first uh, before I put the the uh, cap on is because once I have everything reassembled, I want to make sure that uh, I'm not going, to, I'm not forcing that needle into the tip. And the reason for that is, is if, if you've got the needle chuck tight and the needle's already seated in there and it's it's super tight, what you're going to find is that it will flare as you tighten this up because the needle's got no place to go. So now we're going to tighten this up just so that it's tight. Our needle still has the ability to move. Now we'll push it through, make sure that it's there. Yes, we can see it. And we'll tighten up our chuck. We'll check the action. The action is good. Put back on our handle. Again, make sure that the handle is threading properly because if it's not, you could run into problems. And that is our look at the Iwata Eclipse CS airbrush. And if you're interested in airbrush, I uh, I highly recommend this one. It's good for doing anything. You can spray a pattern of up to two inches in a round pattern or uh, go down to a fine line. So it's great for modelers, great for hobbyists, and great for fine artists. Well, what another jam-packed show for today. We talked about color mixing. We talked about the Iwata Eclipse airbrush. 
we tore it down and put it all back together. Hope that helps you out. Uh, I want to point out that the stuff that you see on today's show, you can find at PM Hobbycraft at pmhobbycraft.ca. Go check them out today. They have great shipping rates and they ship all over the world. Now, I want to mention a, a few websites uh, that you can go and check out uh, around the web. I want you to please check out International Scale Modelers. There's a great little uh, site, uh, and they've got all kinds of great information about modeling. They do reviews. Uh, there are a couple of guys out of the U.K., and they really do a fine job, superb work. Uh, I also want to point out Scale War Machines. Uh, they are another site that is dedicated to doing um, militaries. They have all kinds of videos up there. There's some historical videos as well. Uh, so go check them out. Become a member of their forum. I know I'm a member of their forum, and uh, I've learned a lot from what they, what they have as well. They've got some premium downloads uh, and all kinds of other great stuff. So go and check them out. And uh, really, Scale War Machines is a place to go if you're into armor. Now, uh, I want to point out that you should also go and check out my good friend Jason Garris at Video Workbench. He puts out a new episode every Wednesday. And, uh, you know, with the Wednesday episodes, he teaches you tips, tricks, techniques, shows you all about model building from a professional, I guess semi-professional or professional model builder's point of view. Jason's won many awards uh, in model building, and he's a great asset to the Amazing Plastic family, and we are so proud to be able to uh, bring you his show every Wednesday at Amazing Plastic on G Plus Community, as well as on our um, website at AmazingPlastic.com. Speaking of that, let's, uh, let's tell you where you can find us around the web. You can find us, of course, over at Google+, Plus, where we have a growing community of model builders from all around the world sharing their tips, tricks, model builds, and stories with us about model building, and it's uh, a wonderful little thing to have. So we invite you to come on over if you're not a member already. You can also find us on YouTube, and if you've watched some of our videos over there, please become a, a subscriber. We subscribe to everyone that subscribes to us, so uh, our subscriptions are growing as well as yours will as well. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. You can RSS us from our website and find out whenever there's new material over at the website. And that is at amazingplastic.com. And of course you can find us on Facebook as well. So by all means, go around the web, check us out. And if you like what you see, don't forget to comment and uh, leave us a, a little message. If there's something that you want to see us do here on amazing plastic, by all means, please drop us a line to info at amazingplastic.com, and we'll be happy to respond to your letter. Now, one of the other things I've been asked recently is, where can I get an Amazing Plastic t-shirt? I'm going to a convention uh, in an upcoming few months, and I'd like to be able to wear an Amazing Plastic t-shirt. Well, you can get an Amazing Plastic t-shirt at our good friends at Cafe Press. We've set up a store over there. You can buy t-shirts, work aprons, clocks, all kinds of great stuff, including coffee mugs, travel mugs, and the like. And, uh, you know, every little bit helps. Every time you go over there and you buy a product, a little bit uh, of that money comes to Amazing Plastic. And we're able to go out and buy new kits and, and show you some of the stuff that uh, uh, you want to see. So by all means, if you're looking to, for a way to support us and you want one of these fabulous T-shirts, by all means, go ahead and check us out over at Cafe Press slash Amazing Plastic. And we appreciate you, your support each and every time that you do pick up something. Now. With that being said, that wraps up our show for another Monday. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Richard Cleveland, and we'll see you at the workbench. <laughs>